Welcome to Keyword Saratoga, brought to you as we are every week by Whitehall Stable and Carol Quorum Racing. I'm Seth Merrill, and uh, sitting in with me every Monday morning throughout the meet has been Steve Vick. And Steve, uh, you know, we say it every year. Uh, once Tom Durkin gets the crowd to chant uh, and they're off at Saratoga race number one, the beginning of the meet, the clock starts turning and it just goes way, way too fast. Last day of racing. Looks like it's going to be a beautiful day, but uh, things are winding up. And as I say, it goes quickly. It's one of those oddities. The, the gates open and the next thing you know, it's Labor Day and <laughs> we're, we're done. Uh, no amount of preparation can really get you set for the end of the afternoon, the 11th race today and the old saying that when they turn around and come for home, there's a, a cold wind that follows them. That cold wind already came in. It was last night, waking up to 45 degree temperatures this morning. It, it's been a wonderful meet uh, on a lot of different levels, Seth, and uh, there were all the, all the underpinnings were there and pretty much everything that you expect from Saratoga, we got. Uh, tremendous performances, big names, upsets, some terrific mutuals. I mean, anything you wanted to get out of this meet, you pretty much got. And that started with, you know, tremendous early, early meet performances and it, it went all the way through. It's just been a, it's been dazzling from a personal standpoint. You know, we had a, a win at the meet with our DT stables with Osable Chasm and, and that is something I won't forget. And I wrote this morning, in fact, at, at my website at Derby Trail that, you know, you, you pass through Saratoga and the customs officer stamps your passport and that's pretty much an indelible ink. Uh, when it's all said and done, you, you think back and everybody has various moments, whether it's the friends you see each year uh, here only, uh, or the new friends you make, or the experiences, the wagering, whatever it is that you like to take away from a special place and time, Saratoga gives that to you every year uh, without alloy. And it's, it's been, a, to me, a, a perfect meet in so many ways. Yeah, and we'll take a, a broader look at the, the meet as a whole uh, at the, uh, the last segment of the show today. Should mention our guests today are going to be Mike Rapoli, who's going to wind up being leading owner at the meet. We also have Angel Cordero, who's the agent of John Velasquez. John had to work some horses for uh, Todd Pletcher on the turf this morning, so he couldn't get over here. But we'll have Angel to kind of fill us in as John. Uh, mathematically, I think he's still uh, he's five ahead, but uh, still, you know, it, he would know better than anybody that five ahead isn't a safe lead because uh, last day of 2001, he won six, That's right. six That's races right. on the card. So I don't think Angel and John are going to breathe easy until maybe the fourth or, or fifth race if, if Castellano hasn't won any by then. But it should be an interesting day. I think John has nine mounts. I think Castellano has ten mounts, if I counted correctly, this afternoon or this morning. So uh, a, a lot of fun in that. It's always fun when either the trainer or the jockey race comes down to the last day or the last day or two and, and Castellano and Velasquez over the past couple of weeks have just been riding you know their eyeballs out and it's been fun to watch them as I said though John uh, comes into today with 57 wins Javier Castellano with 52 <clears throat> excuse me on the trainer side uh, Todd Pletcher kind of stepped away from the crowd maybe a week week and a half or so ago really stamped himself but uh, he just came in with too many bullets 36 wins for him going into today Linda Rice with 19 Chad Brown with 17 I, I, I think both Linda and Chad have plenty to be proud about at the meet, though. I think they both put together really good meets. They did. They did. To me, though, when you're going to talk about the the training side and and who can come away feeling particularly good about what they accomplished here, there were some names that I, that jumped out at me as I as I kind of summarized the, the meet. Seth Benzel had a real breakthrough at, at, at this meet. I mean, those that were watching Seth Benzel, who you know knew that as a former assistant to Bill Mott and a former assistant to Todd Pletcher, that, you know, that he would find his way as a trainer with his own horses. We had him on the show last week. He has gone on and, and continued to win as, as the meet has progressed very steadily. And you can see uh, there's some growing confidence. And just like we talk about with riders, Seth, there's moments where you, you get to a point in your, in your career, we talked to Castellano about this last week, where you, you just you ride with confidence. Well, Seth Benzel seems to be placing horses and training horses right now with confidence. He's getting a lot of different kinds of winners. He goes into closing day 10 wins from only 29 starts. 
which is exceptional. Yeah, exceptional. Uh, it's exceptional. A couple of other people who under the radar have had outstanding meats. Kenny McPeak wasn't sure what kind of a meat he was going to have. He's had a very strong meat. Uh, he'll go to Keeneland where he's notoriously strong with a, a, a very good barn right now. Uh, I thought George Weaver, every horse that George Weaver sent to the post was ready to run. And George Weaver, a quiet guy, un, un, kind of unperturbable, uh, just uh, getting it done, I, I thought, uh, on, on every level. Bruce Levine, after a fiasco last year, righted the ship and sent out a bunch of winners and had horses win, place, show uh, with alacrity. Uh, those are the ones. Tommy Proctor, uh, of course. Every horse Tom was sending out, he may end the meet very strong today in the nightcap in the Glens Falls by winning with Kirtana. So there, there were a lot of people not named Pletcher and Rice who struck a chord and with me. I'll actually mention another one who's who's off the sheet here of our of our listings. Michelle Nehi, who, yeah. who only sent out four or five horses, but it had a couple of winners. And Prince Will I am the other day getting into trouble in mid stretch and running making that right. big run. Very impressive. That's when you want to keep your eyes on. But I bring her name up also because, like Seth Benzel, she's a protege of Todd Pletcher, and I think it's going to be fun to watch at, uh, over you know the next five, ten years if Pletcher kind of churns out these trainers out of his operation the way he and others came out of uh, Wayne Lucas's operation, you know, going back 10, 15 years ago. You had uh, Pletcher and McLaughlin and, and a bunch of other names who worked for uh, Lucas, and now it seems like Pletcher, Pletcher's operation, which is as far flung as Lucas's was back then, is, is kind of churning out those types too. Well, Michelle Nehi was an exercise rider as well. She's very accomplished as a horsewoman. Uh, you can look for her today. She's got Dr. Smarty Jack going in the Cliff Gillums at at Ellis Park as well. She's sending out some horses. She kept some back in Kentucky, and uh, there's a very good uh, stake actually today at Ellis. Name for Name, the, uh, uh, the wonderful, uh, just a, a, a chart writer and uh, an irascible character who was just beloved in in at the Pea Patch and and all throughout Kentucky. Cliff Gillum's uh, taken at a young age, uh, long of course with Lou Krybosh, uh, two losses that Ellis Park. Uh, you know, as difficult as things are anyway uh, at Ellis, losing those two was And for rough. people in upstate New York, the, the news came out yesterday that Bob Summers, who was known as the Happy Handicapper in the Buffalo oh, News, yeah. passed away unexpectedly. Uh, had a, oh, wow. Had a, it's age 66, and uh, they were reporting a heart attack. And so that's a shame, too. And as oh, I boy. say, I think he was familiar to a lot of people, certainly out in the western part of the state. But I know in Equidale, I would link to his articles a lot because he covered a lot of the yeah. racing out in the western part of the state in Fort Erie up in uh, uh, Canada, uh, Canada, which is right over well, the border. Well, and, and had success, I think. Did he, uh, who was it that had the, the handicapping contest? His name was tied in. I, I think it was the other writer from Buffalo that won the that won the handicapping championship a couple of years ago. Exactly. Seth, let's let's take a quick glance back. Uh, Angel Cordero is going to join us shortly, but let's take a quick glance at the weekend. We haven't had a chance to talk about it. We'll wrap up the entire meet in the final segment today. It was a, an interesting Saturday, I thought. Uh, here was the Woodward, and of course last year uh, a, a raise the roof kind of afternoon at Saratoga with Rachel Alexandra, a three-year-old filly doing something unprecedented, facing older males at the, the that time of the year. This was a much more mundane version of the Woodward and Quality Road righted the ship uh, but at the same time didn't exactly uh, distinguish himself going off toward uh, the fall championships and the Breeders' Cup uh, Classic probably. It didn't really send himself off I didn't think with any kind of authority in the Woodward. Uh, it seems curiously that a lot of horses are having trouble finishing you know, with any sharpness in, in races down the stretch at Saratoga, the second half of the meet. And so maybe the small, the short come home time is a bit of an anomaly, but I, it just was a, to me, a bit of a lackluster effort. Uh, 150 for the mile in the eighth. I don't know. I, I came away a little bit, uh, a, a little bit unimpressed. And, and that seems to be the consensus. For me, I, I thought, you know, he won by almost five lengths and you know what do you do down this stretch? But you know this this obviously isn't the goal. The goal no. is further down, and, and so how, you know how hard do you push a horse when you you know you're you're winning off by five anyway? So didn't necessarily bother me. Also, uh, Quality Road, 
I think his best races were, were down in Florida. So he may have a little bit of a horse for a course thing working down at Gulfstream. And maybe he's just, he's still a, a, a darn good horse other places, but maybe just not as good as his. And so I think there was a lot of comparison between certainly that race earlier this year down at Gulfstream. And, and the and, Met Mile. He yeah. ran the big Met Mile. And, and that may be really his wheelhouse is that, you know, that one turn. I mean, this family, and Mrs. Rob Sham will talk at the end of the show, has had a remarkable meet. I mean, outrageous between discreetly mine and then yesterday's victory uh, with uh, our uh, the 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 Philly winner yesterday, and uh, oh, and the spin away, uh, our uh, heat lightning, our heat lightning, and also awesome Maria in one division of the risk of her. So a wonderful meet for Mrs. Robsham. Uh, it just seems that I don't know. It just seems to me that that he the quality road is is a horse that just wants a one turn. That's really where his his best running is, is going to be. You know where he can really let it out uh, for you know for half a mile, five eighths. I, I just I, I don't think the mile and an eighth and beyond is is where you're going to get the best of him. Uh, I think you're asking him to do something that is not necessarily in his in his makeup. So anyway, I, but the game plan uh, is to train. Uh, the, absolutely, the absolutely. Classes, that, which, that's which to me is also want. a big uh, a big hurdle well, to anyway. train from from you know this weekend into the Breeders' Cup, but that's their, that, that's their game plan. Let's talk about the grade one forego, because this was one of those wins at Saratoga that there, it had a lot of company, frankly, as the meet uh, from start to finish, whether, uh, whether it was somebody like Ronnie Werner winning the Honorable Miss or uh, Al Stahl winning the Whitney, uh, Steve Hobby coming back again with Telling winning the Sword Dancer. Having Charlie Lepresti come here with Here Comes Ben and win the forego, I, I, I thought this was a delight. Uh, Charlie Lepresti doesn't send out a lot of starters. He'll maybe have 100 starters over the course of a year. He uh, is uh, terrific with developing young horses. This was really, you, you, the, the pleasure that, that this produced, you could just see the, the, the happiness uh, on everybody's face. Alex Solis gets a victory for the meet that pretty much makes up for everything that came the previous 38 days. Solis having a one for 36, one for 38 uh, stint that was making this a, a, a basically a disaster. Comes away with a grade one win in a, a quarter of a million dollar spot. It, it, it solved everything for Alex. So this was a, a, a good win. And here comes Ben with majestic perfection falling by the wayside, unfortunately, for Steve Asmussen and Padua. Here comes Ben emerges on the sprint scene, and he'll have a chance to go back. He's already won three times at Churchill, Seth. Uh, you got to think that he's formidable. And, of course, Alex Solis has won himself a Breeders' Cup sprint. So th there's a little recipe here for success for Charlie Lepresti, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chase, and here comes Ben. Yeah, I thought that horse was live in that race. The disappointment, I think, was Brebon, who didn't, didn't really fire. Didn't do any running. I, I think that, you know, nope. he was certainly one to consider. Uh, Vineyard Haven was a horse that, when you looked at the race and looked at the figures, that he ran third, I don't think was a real shock. So, um, you know, as I say, I think that the winner here comes Ben was certainly live in the race. And as you mentioned, it was a great win for the trainer and for Alex Solis. And Alex Solis, a guy who was based out in Southern California. And like a lot of riders, not a lot, but a handful of riders over the past year or so have made their way out of Southern California, which is kind of a racing jurisdiction in flux right now. Solis was down in Kentucky earlier and came up to to uh, Saratoga to ride, and it's always tough to kind of ship in and you know make the connections with the various uh, trainers and whatnot. So he already had this connection with a Kentucky trainer and gets a grade one win. And as you said, no matter what kind of meet you're having, if you can get the grade one win on Labor Day weekend, it makes up for a lot. No, it did, and uh, you know you say the connections. Certainly, his his agent Brian Beach got him on horses. We used them on Osable Chasm in her first start. The reality was that Alex wasn't riding very well. He was making some bad decisions, and he didn't look like a near Hall of Famer for the lion's share of, of the experience here at Saratoga. However, this was a ride that was just textbook, and he had the right horse. And in fact, I think even if you go back and look at the quotes from Alex, he said, if you have the engine, then you can get the job done. And that's, I think, exactly what went on here. He rode him 
just smoothly and efficiently, and, and this was a horse that just cruised into contention and right on by uh, the pace setters. I mean, it, it, you, you were watching him at all. You could see that he was a clear winner mid-stretch. He was the horse moving by far the best. And that's seven furlongs. He's got to be sharpened. They're going to have to put some speed in him to get him right for the Breeders' Cup sprint because as we've learned in prior years, seven furlongs is not six furlongs. There's a very big difference. It's one of the reasons that the Vosberg was shortened from seven to six. Back when Angel Cordero joins us, we'll ask Angel about that because there, there's a big difference. And in fact, Seth, you think about horses that were successful winning seven furlong sprints in September and October leading up to Breeders' Cup. There were a lot of them that then failed to get up in, in the Breeders' Cup sprint. That's one of the reasons I like Here Comes Ben. It, it, I think seven furlongs is kind of a specialty, and, and he'd already proven himself there. And, and it is a very different different kind of a scenario than seven to six. So it will be interesting to we'll see. We'll talk to Angel they... about that. we got a perfect guest to explain that. And Angel Cordero will be coming up next. We'll take our first break now. And uh, Angel Cordero, the agent of John Velasquez. John Velasquez, as we mentioned earlier, coming into the last day of the meet with a five uh, win lead so uh, he's he looks like he's gonna uh, sew up the uh, meat title today but certainly it's gonna be fun to go through the first uh, three or four races or so and see how that works out but when we come back Angel Cordero stay tuned come on Papa. Join the Karakoram racing team as a partner with Karakoram you will see your New York bread run at Aqueduct, Belmont and Wait, you ready for the Puerto Rican Day Parade with the red the blue and the yellow circle with trainers Linda Rice, Jeff Odens, and Jimmy Jerkins. Get started for as little as $4.99 and get the kind of excitement that can only come with owning a winning racehorse. Visit Karakorum.com, then call 888-521-RACE and get on your way to fulfilling your dreams. Keyword Saratoga, Steve Bick along with Seth Merrow and always a fun time when you can turn and welcome a guest in like Hall of Famer Angel Cordero. It's closing day at Saratoga 2010. Angel isn't winning riding titles anymore, but he's helping direct riding titles. John Velasquez, of course, uh, handled by Angel Cordero. Angel Cordero joins us. Thank you very much for having me. Angel, it's always great when you come up here and have a successful meet. Johnny has ridden just absolutely brill brilliantly. He and Javier Castellano clearly have separated themselves during the summer from everybody else. Talk about what has gone into the success we've seen as John on the cusp of a riding title again at the spot. Well, we came in uh, to Saratoga with good weapons. We have uh, the best trainer. We got the best horses to ride. We have the best blacksmith. We got the best doctor. I got the best Jackie. The only one is no best is me, but because I hang around with them, I get a little better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we came in into, uh, to Saratoga with good ammunition, and Johnny's performing, like you say, very good. So do Javier. They both riding outstanding, and Javier is, is putting a tremendous show. Uh, and lucky with being with us. You know, we have most of the races stay on the grass. 
That's our true. horses Good are point. performing, so we loaded with babies, so everything worked out. Good sons got, and uh, I'm glad that I am in the same boat with them. Well, you won over 7,000 races in your career, 14 riding titles here at Saratoga, 11 in a row, as you just mentioned at one point. Johnny has, this has got to be what, his fourth or third? Four, probably. Four, I think, right? It, it, take us back, Angel, a few years ago to Keeneland when, when John got hurt. And we, we talk about this with jocks because uh, the, the, the fans and the horse players, you know, they, they get down when riders aren't riding well and, and they're not winning, their timing is off. When John got hurt, it, it took him a long time to get back to that high level that he's now been sustaining again for the last year and a half or so or two years. It was two reasons. Uh, we lost uh, about a quarter of, of, of top places horses uh, when Gomez came in to replace him. That's a good point. He came back and he did a good job with the horses. He went, so of course that had to keep him riding. And so when we came back, some of these horses was riding with him. He kept, we got, we got a few of them. Plus, I think we came back a little too quick. And, um, this is a kind of sport that if you not work, you're not going to make money. You know, when a jockey got hurt, he lose mounts, he lose stables, he lose good horses. So you got to come back quicker than you want to because that's the only way you're going to make good money. So most of the riders, uh, they always come back a little quicker than we should. And um, that's the price you pay sometimes, you know. But like you say, the timing is off a little bit, but uh, it's also that you don't, you're not eligible to ride that many horses on a day. The more you ride, the better chances you get to win. It's like throwing punches. The more punches you throw, the more you score. So uh, Johnny is not too fond of riding too many horses because Johnny's got a lot of old injuries. and He's not like me that was keyed up to do something. He wants to win, but he wants to win it his way. I wanted to win it anyway because he's more like, you know, he doesn't want to ride a car. And you know he's very, very low key. Uh, but when he comes to Saratoga, he give me a little green light about riding a little more horses, and we always have good. Uh, Johnny have broke a record here that I chased for 20 years. A Casas record on 28 day racing, 41 winners, and the closest I got was 39. And Johnny destroyed that record one year. Yeah. Then he won six on one day that nobody ever did that. Yeah. It was five of us title with five winners. So everything is. Uh, Everything has been working good for him. Uh, last year we didn't have a real great meeting, but I don't know if you remember, it was a time when Johnny went down like four times in one week. Yeah. And he was kind of, he was feeling better about himself, and I was feeling better, but I know he was hurting and we had to continue riding. It's <laughs> uh, all right. That. You, uh, you, you know, you mentioned he doesn't like to take a, a, a lot of mounts per day, but today I think you, you've got you're on nine mounts. It's the last day. You're going for the meet title. He's five ahead. But as I mentioned earlier, when do you guys breathe the sigh of relief? Because if there's anybody who knows five isn't enough, it's John who on the last day in 2001 won six. I so know. when are you guys going to be able to sit back and kind of? I don't think so. I think uh, we have to wait when he's uh, six races going, because he's a Javier, which he's capable to win five or six of them. He, you know, he won, Johnny, won five earlier in the meeting. Yeah, meet. and if he wins six and Johnny draw a blind, so that's a big loss. It's like being in front by 20 lengths and stuff. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, I hope that Johnny can win one race. And if Javier can win uh, five races, I don't blame him. I don't want him to win six unless I win one. <laughs> if I win one, Javier, you go win six. <laughs> But why don't you just win four and let me beat you by one? <laughs> and, and John uh, uh, started, as I understand, at the, uh, the jockey school in Puerto Rico. Now, how did he get from there te to teaming up with you? It's a great story. Yeah, well, he was on the jockey school, and a very good friend of mine that I grew up with him called me and told me, I have a very talented rider that I want to send to you. I said, how many races he won? He said, six. I said, I don't know you want to bring a guy to New York, you know, that only won six races. Cause People like to see the jockeys win more, but my wife was training at the time. I was riding for Bob Caceres. He had a big outfit at the time, and he promised me that he would give me a chance with him. So we brought Johnny back. At the first time I looked at his film, I wasn't impressed, to be honest with you. I said, I don't know if he wants to continue here. So I kept looking at the film, looking for something that will ask, because I don't want to say no to the guy. But Richie Allen, the baseball player. I was player. just about to say, tell Dick Allen ties he, into this. He was at Great the house start. with me, and yeah. he walked in, and he said, what are you doing, brother? I said, I'm watching. They want to send me this kid here, but I don't think he's ready for New York. And he sat there for about 10 minutes, and he turned around and he said to me, you know, that kid reminds me of you. 
when you first started. <laughs> yep. I said, you serious? He said, yeah. I said, no kidding. He said, you think he can do good here? He said, I think he can do beautiful. I said, you coaching and coming in here, learning from other writers. So kidding and on, I said, well, you want to be his agent? And he said, yes. So that was Johnny's first agent. It was Dick Allen, and of course, Dick's brother, Hank, uh -huh. was a he, trainer at the a time. He was a trainer, yeah. And Richie introduced him to a couple of people from Jersey that he knew. And then he come back to me one day, he said, brother, he said, this kid is too much of a good writer. I don't have the time to give to him because he had to go to sign autograph and travel a lot. Yeah. He said, why don't we just get him a, an agent that can do her? Johnny had like seven or eight agents. I kept getting an agent, he don't work good. I said, Johnny, I fired that one, I got you another one. <laughs> and we kept going, I'm going, I'm going. And then all of a sudden I quit writing and he asked me, he said, you want to be my agent? I said, I don't think I want to be an agent. A year went by and my wife said, why don't you take him? He said, you know, it's like your son. I said, no, that's a problem. That it's like my son, and it's going to be very hard to work. You know, because I used to yell at him when he used to ride my horses and run better. I said, now nah, he's going to get even with me. <laughs> he said, now nah, he won. He's very patient. He's a very nice, cool guy. So, you know, the more I got to know Johnny, the more I got to like him. He's like part of my family. And so when I went to work with him, I told him, I said, I don't know much about being an agent. I said, I know how to spot a good horse, and I know how to spot a good trainer. I said, but I'm not much of a handicapping for winning. Jack is handicapped to see how you ride your horse. People think Jack is a bad handicapper. It's not like that. We don't handicap to gamble. We handicap to see you guys speed, you guys see what I'm going to be. Yeah. It's a whole different story when you handicap to gamble on horses. But things work out very good since day one with him. And uh, Sam got to that place, to be honest with you, because he's been my savior. You know? I know some people say on the race that if it wasn't for top pleasure and Johnny, I'd be walking horses, but that's okay. I got lucky, and that's what it counts. Everybody's got to get lucky in this game. Angel, we were talking before the break, before you came on, about the win on Saturday by Here Comes Ben. Seven furlongs, and of course, years ago, the Vosburg was seven. It was cut to six to help uh, compensate and help people prepare for the Breeders' Cup Sprint. You won Breeders' Cup Sprints in 88 and 89, Talk about taking a seven furlong horse, going seven eighths, and getting them to sharpen their speed to win at six in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. That part, I don't think is that hard. Because a horse that can win seven eighths, usually you know he could be going three quarters. It's harder to make a horse go longer than they want to go. Uh, the sprint races, for experience, most of the horses that win the sprint races, they come from off the pace. I win it with goals, came from behind. I win it with uh, my gay his horse, and he came from way back. Uh, I see a lot, most of the spring races that I remember on British Cup, they win by horses coming from behind. So uh, I don't think that is that hard. The position in the gay is the most important thing when you go on the spring races. You get a horse that doesn't want to be inside, like say Benji and Hever, he got killed by the post position. That poor horse drove inside most of the time, and it's a great horse, it's a beautiful horse. He got a rough trip most of the time when you're on the inside and you're on the horse to beat everybody look for you. But coming from seven, eight to three quarters, I don't see him that hard. I, I like that. I like it better than coming from distance to go short. Well, on that topic then, let's use that as a conversation point for Quality Road and your impressions of what it's going to take between now and Breeders' Cup Classic time to get a horse that just seems to be maybe better with professional, uh, with the like a, the one-turn mile. Here he is from Saturday winning the Woodward, and Johnny's really riding him here the last 16th to, to, you know, to maintain that, uh, that separation. Uh, what about getting him a mile and a quarter? What's going to have to happen between now and Breeders' Cup? Well, to be honest to you, the time that Quality Road tried a mile and a quarter, he was in disadvantage. Last year when we run in the Travers, he was so because his fee problem. We run one race going six and a half full on here. Absolutely. And then two weeks later, he come back. It was not much he could do after he run to work him to go that far. Okay. He still run a very good race. He had a bad break, and he doesn't like mud. He runs good because he's a good horse, but that's not his favorite track. The two times he runs going to man a quarter, he catch a wet track. So the day he won the other day, you know, I mean, not to defense Jan anything. When horses get older, they get the tendency to get a little more lazy. Uh, he's a very powerful horse. Seems to me, I never rode him and I never been on it, but seems to me like he's a better horse when he follows something. And he gets more aggressive when he's following something. When he suddenly, he very relaxed, and it's very hard for a horse, like when he got beat. He got horses coming at him on the three-quarter pole. He opened up a little bit. They was walking. 
But Yanni said he was never on a bridle. So every time they come at him, he just stay in front of them. So it's hard for a horse to stop and go, stop and go. When, when you put a tiger on it, you just follow him. And when you pass him, you got the momentum going. Uh, he wants to see the horse that win it, but the horse that Moskeman was right behind on, on his on three quarters of the length, so he could not come out anymore to see the other horse. Yep. He kept looking at him, people blaming him for that, but that's okay. But the reason he was doing that, because he wanted Quality Road to see that horse coming before he got to him. And he didn't work out that way. The other day he rode him and he was on the lead, and he had to ride him because he's getting onto that moment that he pulls his ears up and he think everything is going easy for him. But it had nothing to do with his ability of going this time. I'm very, very sure, I'm positive that he could handle a mile and a quarter the same way he handled a mile and an eight. I don't have a worry about that. I like that he's not going to run anymore to the British Cup. Would that give Tatsy time to train in the way he wants to train? Okay. You don't have to train on a pressure, on a schedule. That like you don't miss a day, you cry, oh man, I can't, can't work because the track is wet. So you lose two, three days. And it takes a lot on you when you're getting close to a race. But when you have that many days in between, he had time to let him rest a little bit, to unwind, and to get him back again. And that is very good training horses going on. I see them going baby, going on. They go from five full on or three quarters to a man and 16 or man and eight. So I don't have a worry about it. I just hope the track is not wet. Because he does, he'll run, but he doesn't handle it as good. And I think it's probably going to be one of the most exciting British Cup between Blame and him and Sanjara. They are two, three outstanding horses. And then you got looking at Lucky, which is a very outstanding three-year-old. So it's going to be a very, very good race. It's not going to be a walkover for none of them. Well, and then you also can maybe uh, have a similar conversation about Devil May Care and getting her uh, back at things and, and getting her pointed back in the direction. She may head to the Cotillion and face off against Blind Luck again, ultimately headed for the Distaff, the, the ladies' classic. And I got to think that, you know, th that matchup, I mean, if it's going to end up being Devil May Care, Blind Luck, uh, Rachel Alexandra, and whoever else, that you've got the potential life at 10, I suppose. 10 There's going to be some yeah. decision there. Uh, you got the same kind of opportunity to, uh, you know, to, with Devil May Care moving forward. She's very talented. She put up some big races. I don't think she run her race here. Not no, because she, she got beat. Horses could get beat and still run a good race. I don't think she performed at his uh, best ability, but she did two other races before. She's young and she's talented and she's on her way up. Uh, Horses change a lot. Phillies, especially Philly, they get the tendency that to depreciate a little when they get older, they're not as good as they was when they was young. It's hard to keep them going. It's like keeping a woman happy. It's very hard to keep a Philly on the best condition all year around. So, you know, I always for experience notice that if they're very talented at two and at three, when they turn four, they kind of slow down. Now, if they're not too good, like I used to write relaxing, and she was a mother of sure. easy going. She wasn't that good at two or three, but they was ready to retire her at four, and I asked Mr. Flip, I said, you know, this field is getting very good now. I think she, she can handle that, even the calls. And, you know, he looked at me and he said, you sure? He said, I was going to breed him. I said, well, I don't want to stop him from breeding, but I think if she runs this year, she'll be the best field. And she came back and dead. Absolutely. She won on the dirt, yeah. she won on the grass, yeah. she did the call. And I got beat that far with John Henry on the golf course, but I had to lose a lot of ground with her. So, it all depends. Like Sanjara didn't race much as young, and now she can last longer. Yep. But Rachel Alexander took a big campaign as a three-year-old, and she probably didn't come back as good as she was last year, but she's still dangerous. She's mm -hmm. still on the game. And like the other day, head and life at 10, went and opened up and got beat with a filly probably that didn't have a license to mm -hmm. beat him. But Rachel is another horse that I noticed that she likes to follow something. And she likes to come in the stretch and pass him, and that makes him braver. And the other day she was on the lead, and the other field was right next to her. So it was no, you know, I knew something was going to happen because it's two good horses, none of them went back up. Angel Cordero, as always, uh, uh, you could talk for hours, and we could bring up subject after subject, and uh, you've got an experience from your great career that saw you win over 7,000, put you in the Hall of Fame. There's uh, uh, always, always, Terrific to see you uh, wherever we go, uh, the biggest meets and Breeders' Cup and in New York. Congratulations on uh, helping Johnny uh, come to the edge here of, a, of another riding title at Saratoga and continued success. Well, I thank you very much. I also want to take the opportunity to thank all the owners and trainers that gave me the chance with Johnny and made it possible.
especially I had two good customers with that. Uh, Mike Vapoli and Mr. Evans have been very supportive, Johnny. Uh, they never took me off a horse. They let me ride all them good horses. So I want to thank everybody and thank the public to keep our game alive. Exactly. Angel Cordero. Seth, we're going to take a break? Yeah, we'll take a break. And when we come back, uh, leading owner at the meet, Mike Rapoli, will join us. So stay tuned as Keyword Saratoga continues. No, it's great. Tremendous. Thanks. Join the Karakoram yeah, racing very good. team. As Excellent. a partner with Karakoram, you will see your New York bread run at Aqueduct, Belmont, and Saratoga. You will get your picture taken in the winner's circle with trainers Linda Rice, Jeff Odens, and Jimmy Jerkins. Get started for as little as $4.99 and get the kind of excitement that can only come with owning a winning racehorse. Visit Karakoram.com, then call 888-521-RACE and get on your way to fulfilling your dreams. Welcome back to Keyword Saratoga. We just had Angel Cordero, agent for uh, the meat leading jockey, John Velasquez, as that battle is going to go down to the wire this afternoon. On the other hand, leading owner looks like it's sewed up, and we have joining us right now Mike Rapoli, who is uh, currently the leading owner. 13 wins at the meet so far? 13, 13 wins, Nick. Uh, uh, 13 wins at this meet, Seth, and you know, a pretty uh, big difference from last year where we had zero wins. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun this year. And, and let me ask you, you know, as I was kind of researching you last night, uh, um, uh, you, you had uh, Stop Spending Maria, was it yesterday, or was it No Shopping Maria yesterday? But yeah, yes, yes, they were Stop Spending Maria, and Sky Soya was the entry. And, yes. and, and uh, so you've got the two Maria horses, and I, as I understand, your wife's name is Maria, so there's got to be a story there. Uh, well, the story is that uh, as I keep making money, my wife likes to keep, keep spending money, so we have a competition who can make more or spend more. Uh, right now, I'm closely ahead. Uh, but she's gaining a lot of ground, and after our horse ran 50 yesterday, I think uh, Stay Thirsty needs to do something in the hopeful. How, what do you think of Stay Thirsty this afternoon? You know, I mean, Boys of Tuscanova is uh, obviously uh, a pretty special horse, and, you know, I, I like the one advantage that we have, that he's only gone five furlongs twice, but uh, I spoke to Dutro, he loves his horse, uh, we love Stay Thirsty, but the horse is a, a Bernardini, and he's, um, you know, he's bred to go a mile and a quarter, mile and a half, he's not really bred to go seven furlongs. I mean, what we've seen out of him at five and a half furlongs and six furlongs has been real exciting. Uh, you know, going from five to seven the first time, I know he ran a 102, it was at Belmont. You know, he's got to show it to me today. Uh, uh, I asked Todd if we can swap out Uncle Mo for Stay Thirsty today, and uh, he said no chance. But, uh, Actually, uh, we have some footage of Uncle Mo, and we wanted to ask you about that horse. Uh, certainly a, a very impressive performance from Uncle Mo. And in fact, uh, regardless of the stakes races, Uncle Mo could be one of the most impressive two-year-old performances at the meet. And we're we're going to watch the race here. Give us a little background on Uncle Mo and what you're looking for as you go forward with this one. 
You know, you know, what's great about Todd Fletcher is, you know, last year he had four horses in the Derby, and you know when Todd Fletcher likes a horse in his barn, you got to feel pretty good because he gets some of the best two-year-olds in the country. And from day one, he basically was saying, Mike, Uncle Moe's my best two-year-old. So when he tells, when Todd Fletcher tells you Uncle Moe's your best two-year-old, his best two-year-old, you got to feel pretty confident. Um, he actually worked with Stay Thirsty three different times. Uh, Stay Thirsty was in a drive. Uncle Moe was nice and relaxed, and Uncle Moe beat him every single time. So everything he raced against, he beat. Uh, we definitely liked them a lot, but once they pull that latch, we really don't know. Uh, you really don't know what's going to happen first time starter. Uh, we really like, even though he went for the lead, he was very, you know, he was, he rated nice. Johnny really just asked him to, to run at the eighth pole, and he opened up from four to 14 lengths in a blur. Uh, so we're excited about him. You know, listen, obviously the goal is the Champagne, which is going to be on October 9th, and uh, it's a one mile, and then obviously the Breeders' Cup, but. We all know this is racing, and it's, it's uh, you know, today he, he galloped, tomorrow he's going to gallop, and it's one day at a time with horse racing. And, uh, yeah, he runs out here beautifully, so he's going to be an exciting two-year-old to watch for the rest of the year. Congratulations with him. I want to ask you a nuts and bolts question. I read a Q&A uh, that you uh, had in a magazine. I'm more on the business side, but you said when you hire people, you're looking for people that have a passion and are very competitive. And when you get them in there, you ask if they're sore losers because that shows <laughs> if somebody doesn't like to lose, that shows they have that passion and competitiveness. Do you look for the same kind of hiring techniques and the same qualities when you're out shopping for trainers? No, no, no doubt about it. To me, uh, you know, I always say, uh, you know, when I get interviewed, the, the prim and proper answer when they ask you if you're a sore loser is to say, no, I'm not a sore loser. I learned from losing. But... You know, listen, I got 13 wins this meet, and I'm so happy, but I also got 32 losses. And uh, I'm going to remember those 32 losses as much as I remember the 13 wins. And no matter what it is, I'm real competitive. And I like to hire passionate, competitive people. Uh, right now, I've partnered up with Todd Pletcher, uh, who's, you know, obviously, you know, there's a 2,000 trainers in this game, but he's a trainer and he's a CEO. Whether it was a basketball coach, whether it was a CEO for a Fortune 500 company, he would be successful no matter what he does. And, you know, we, we email back and forth 12 times a day. We, we talk to each other two, three times a day. We just have a great relationship right now, and uh, there's no doubt, uh, you know, he's always, he said to me, if you're the most competitive person I ever met, I'm a close second. And, you know, you know even though he, you know, he, he doesn't really show that, uh, and is, you know, too, he doesn't get too high and he doesn't get too low, he definitely is, you know, when you talk to him one-on-one -on -one and you have a horse with him, he cares and he wants to win every single race just like I do. And just before I hand it over to Steve, we mentioned uh, an article, that, uh, the Q&A on the business side. Uh, what is your business background for people who don't know, and then how did that lead you into the horse game? Um, well, I was a co-founder of Vitamin Water. And in uh, 2007, we sold our company uh, to Coca-Cola, which was great. And uh, now I also own uh, Pirate's Booty Snacks. And I also own a chain of healthy fast food restaurants called Energy Kitchen. So I'm still very involved in businesses. Uh, and then I have a poly stable, and uh, I have a great family office called German Capital Management. But, you know, yeah, the horses really just started as a 13-year-old kid. I mean, I was just a little poor kid from Queens. Uh, I used to go to a track at 13, you know, at, uh, you know, at 13 years old with my mom's permission and without my mom's permission. <laughs> I used to take my, my allowance and anything I can really take out of her wallet when she wasn't looking. And, uh, you know, you used to just go to a track, find the nearest 75-year-old man and ask him to put a $2 bet in for me. And, you know, to me, reading the racing form was more about, like, predicting the future and trying to, just trying to be right. So I really think that it sounds weird that, reading a racing form helped me in business, but sure. it really makes you think and, and why you, you like this horse versus that horse. And it really, it was really more of a thinking strategy process that helped me in, in, in business. Steve? I, Mike, I, you know, from a lot of standpoints, I was going to talk to you about some horses, but we'll take a second and follow up on, on your entry into the game. Uh, you're a quintessential uh, younger owner that is, is bringing a, a verve to the game, and it, it's, it's contagious. Uh, it, it's encouraging. I mean, talk about your impression of the game. You wouldn't be investing the capital you have uh, into it if you didn't think that there's a future here and that it's something that can grow as opposed to uh, some of the negative opinion out there that says that we're in we're at death's door and we're in a death spiral I'm, I'm sick of hearing that and I talk constantly on the radio against that viewpoint but talk about your impression of the game and apply uh, the emerging business uh, philosophies that have seen yeah. you successful with a, a product like vitamin water and then a healthy snack like pirates booty uh, talk about how you think you can utilize that expertise to help build the game well I'm, I'm actually you know, uh, Steve will be surprised I'm actually negative about the sport I really think that this is the worst marketed sport in America mm -hmm. no, and no, no, no. in my opinion I've been very uh, hands I've had, I've had dinner with Charles Hayward I've had dinner or uh, drinks with Hal, uh, Hal Handel uh, I'm friends with PJ um, you know we've been in survival mode here in Naira 
now with the VLTs coming in, you need to start to invest and spend. And, you know, it seems like the game is being run by the good old boys that have been around for 80 years, and that's got to change. And, and, you know, I want to be an advocate for the sport. I want to be an advocate for horse rescue. And I do think that there are people like me that want to get into this game, but they get in and, you know, they, they, they invest 3 to $5 million in two years, and it disappears so quickly that you just say, you know what, I have $5 million. I'd rather... Uh, buy myself a yacht or something yeah, like that, something, buy a boat. Get something out of it. Exactly. But, but I do think that, the, you know, there is a great future in the game, and, and I think Charlie and Hal want to change that. But, you know, I, I just don't like the way, you know, Mammoth is out to put New York out of business, and New York is out to put Mammoth out of business, and California has its own rules, and nobody's really working together in the game. And if, if we all work together in this game, at the end of the day, every track is going to be successful. And if I can help New York build a model that works here, I guarantee you, California, Kentucky, Florida, New Jersey will all follow suit. So if we don't work together, this is the only sport where we, tracks compete versus tracks. There's, yeah. there's no partnerships. I agree. And, and we need to bring in a new clientele because I think the perception of anybody under 60 is that this is, a, this is an all-time game. And, uh, you know, I want to change that perception. I think it can be changed. Uh, but we, we do no marketing for the sport. You know, the animals don't get marketed, the jockeys don't get mm -hmm. marketed, the, the owners great. don't get marketed, and, 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 the, and the trainers don't get oh, marketed. The lifestyle, too. The whole lifestyle of the game and, and the, the sociability aspect, which is completely underutilized. We have these beautiful facilities that could be used as Un the way they are in Australia as, as social centers uh, where young adults bring, their, bring dates. Uh, they, they show up mid-afternoon. They bet five or six races. Then they stay all night to dinner and dance. Okay. It, 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 that's, a, that's standard at, at Australian racetracks. We've got these these beautiful palaces that sit empty night after night. I did see where Gulfstream has announced uh, over the last few days they're going to install uh, lights, taking the, the cue from Churchill, and it does seem that more and more flat tracks are, are going to try to take advantage of the night opportunity to, uh, to again, to increase the social aspect. I mean, the success of those Friday night cards at Churchill uh, I mean, is, is un. It's just unquestionable. The Thirty thousand people coming up on a Friday night, making the place alive, electric, uh, you know, the clubby atmosphere. That's a winner. And 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 I, and I think that's the biggest problem is when you want to invest in your brand. And right now, our brand is horse racing. You don't see the immediate results overnight. It takes time to see those those results. I lost money with my business for the first five years. I mean, Naira would have cut the plug after three years. You got to invest and spend. And you know what? Getting these people at the track, giving them a good experience is going to be why they want to come back. And you know, you guys go to restaurants all the time. If you have a good experience, you have good service, you not only come back, but you tell your friends about it. And this is an experience where, you know, you're, I mean, at Saratoga, everybody has a great time. But I get news to you, on Saturday at Belmont, there'll be 2,300 fans there versus 35,000 fans that are going to be here today. Sure. Big difference. Right, well, There's only 14 million people in New York and, uh, and, and, and less than a million up here. So how does that happen? Able, we should be able to find able to a few more thousand. Every single day. Well, in talking about investment spending, you spent 500000 on Stay Thursday, yeah. and you actually boosted this one. This is a family that Bob LaPenta typically is waiting like a vulture to take the babies. He, of course, had Superfly, and he had Andromeda's Hero out of this dam. Uh, this is a Bernardini, and this first crop, uh, they are running. And this one is really bred. You mentioned uh, classic distance in the in the uh, long term picture, but uh, the way he ran early in in the five and a half furlong race mid July at Belmont, and then in breaking his maiden, really has got to uh, had to surprise and please you know you and Todd uh, today you know stretching out to seven. This is this is a race everybody's basically giving it to Boys of Tuscanova, and then also tossing in Wine Police as as a serious contender. Uh, you're laying in the weeds. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt. I mean, if you would have told me in February when I spent five hundred thousand dollars on this horse that he's going to be running at belmont at five and a half frongs and run an 88 buyer in one second and then win by six on a hand yep. ride in august i would have said you're crazy i mean this is a horse that's meant to be a three-year-old and he's showing us yep. everything he can right now and you know what i mean boys of tuscanova is going to be tough to beat today there's no doubt about it um you know he's got nine weeks off but going from five to seven furlongs after nine weeks off I i'd be a little concerned i know rick talks highly about him and i'm, I'm excited about him but you know what? Next year when we go a mile and a quarter and we go a mile and an eighth, I, I like my chances versus those two of us today. Let me also throw in a couple of plugs for your other trainer, for Bruce Levine. And, of course, uh, Roaring Lion and uh, Driven by Success went from, from Bruce to, to Todd. But Roaring Lion had a nice summer at uh, down at Monmouth, yep. won the Teddy Drone. And the other two-year-old that's going unmentioned, Never Right Joey. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, the great thing is, 
I'm the leading owner here with 13 wins, but I won with four different trainers. So we really spread the wealth out, which Bruce is really Brown. Nice. Bruce Brown won, Mike Cushion won, Bruce Levine won, and uh, Todd won eight out of the 13. Uh, Raw Online, Bruce has done an amazing job at Raw Online. He's probably going to be headed for Maryland Million Day. We'll probably give him another month off. Uh, you know, great $25,000 claim, uh, and I think he's run out over $500,000. So we're, we're real happy with him. and. Uh, you know, and uh, you know he'll be tough in the Maryland Millions running against the State Birds. You also have one of my favorite horses that's under the radar and just plugs along, Winaholic. Yeah. Well, there's, there's two things. First, I'll talk about Never, Never Ride Joey is actually, yeah. uh, uh, he's a nice New York bred. I'm not going to go to Finger Lakes. Uh, I'm a kid from Queens. I want to go to Aqueduct. I want to go to Belmont. I want to run to Saratoga. So he's going to stay in New York and run there. But he's a tap, and, and as he stretches out, he'll be even better. Um, and Winaholic actually... He's still growing. He's, the, he's, he's a Clydesdale. He's not a horse. He's a Clydesdale. <laughs> and he's three, but he's really two. So we're going we're gonna to put him on the farm. I think his future is going to be on the turf. Um, his mom has unbridled memories, and they just had an El Prado went first time out on the turf. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to put her away for next turf season, and he's going to come back. And you know, we try to make him a dirt horse because we want him to be a dirt horse, but I think I got a turf horse. I never look to buy turf horses. They become, they become turf exactly. horses. <laughs> and and what a horse will be a turf horse. Well, you say that until, until we see you buy a Dynaformer. Then, you, then, then, then yeah. you'll have a, bought a, a turf horse. Then exactly right. <laughs> and, and you won't see one, by the way, just so you know. Well, Mike, before we wrap up, uh, I just have a quick question because I'm a Syracuse graduate, a Big East guy, and uh, I know you're a St. John's graduate. I read your dream job as a kid was to coach St. John's. So, uh, you know, from the old days, if St. John's isn't playing Syracuse, from the Luke Connor second days, I root for St. John's. So I'll ask you, Steve Lavinger, to turn that program around finally? Well, first of all, if I, if I would have known you went to Syracuse, I probably would have never done the interview. That's the first thing. So I'm glad that you hid that from me. We'll put uh, that at the end. We'll put that at the end. Strategically. Ah! Second thing, growing up, actually my favorite college basketball player of all time is Pro Washington. Uh, I wanted to be Pro Washington. That half-court shot where uh, Half-court shot against Boston College, I remember that, but he was just so quick. Uh, and he went from boys and girls high school. Um, I'm very involved in St. John's basketball. I talk to Lavin uh, once a week, email him every day. Um, we haven't you know, we've been non-existent uh, non yeah, uh, for 10 years. Yeah. And Steve's definitely going to, he's got a great recruiting class coming in for 2011. Names that are about to give us commitments. We have nine seniors coming back this year. And, uh, you know, I'll be sitting in the first row, but St. John's basketball is going to be back, and they're going to be a beast of the Big East uh, within the next couple of years. Well, like I say, if they're not playing Syracuse, I root for them. They're back from the kind of second days, the Raleigh Massimino days and whatnot, so hopefully they'll, they'll turn that around. Well, Mike, uh, again, congratulations on the meet. We will uh, also wish you good luck on this afternoon and going forward with Uncle Mo, as I said, looks like a real monster. So, again, congratulations and, and good luck going forward. I appreciate, I appreciate it, Seth. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Right. Right. Mike Papoli, leading owner at the meet, and uh, we're going to take our last break right now. When we come back, Steve and I will just take a quick uh, kind of overview of the Saratoga meet and wrap things up here for Capital OTB programming from the backstretch for the 2010 season. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Keyword Saratoga. I'm Seth Merrow, sitting in every Monday morning during the meet with Steve Vick. And as noted, this is the last Monday morning, Monday, September 6th, the last day of the meet. Do want to remind you, though, that if you're, you know, you haven't been up yet, or even if you have been up yet and you're just kind of debating, it is a gorgeous day. Sun's out, temperatures are very comfortable. So uh, if you're if you're debating, you got one last chance, and it's going to be a beautiful day. Steve, uh, you know, talking about the weather. Boy, we have had great weather the whole meet. Opening day, there was some rain. There was a, some sprinkles and some showers on a couple other days. Yeah. But overall, I think the weather's been gorgeous. The turf course, I don't think that helps so much because the no. last couple of weeks, no. people have really been complaining that uh, uh, handicapping goes out the window a little bit. Uh, as they get into the stretch, nobody is making up ground. No. I think the racing overall has been a lot of fun. Uh, people have talked about the quality of racing, but as I think as we get into the Eclipse Awards, uh, you know, in January or whatnot, I think you're going to see some Eclipse Awards winners will have come out of here. I think the stakes races have been good. And day to day, I think the racing quality has been there, given not just what's stabled here, but just the situation in the country as a whole, the yeah. whole crop down and the, the quality of horses. So I, I think, you know, the meat overall, racing, weather, and just kind of the, the fun of being here day in and day out, I think it's been great. No, there's no doubt. And, uh, you know, you get out of racing what you put into it. Uh, those that get upset that uh, were saying, oh, there never used to be 20 maiden claimers at Saratoga. Stop with that. It's if you would rather PJ Campo write allowance races that draw five and six horses because that's all there are. There's there just is a dearth of quality horses. We we don't have seventy five thousand claimers in this country anymore that run every uh, two three weeks. That era is over. So you have to take the horses, the population that is available, and you write those races. The public has spoken repeatedly, Seth, that what they want is bettable races with full fields that get the best mutuals. The best way for horse players to beat the takeout is with races that produce major exotic hits. Big exactas, big trifectas, big supers, big dime supers, pick threes, pick fours, pick fives, and pick sixes. That is our game now. Not, not you know, 10 to 40 win mutuals. The, the exotics is where it is. So having 10 and 12 horse fields is, is what works. And if that means more 10,000 non-winners of two lifetime, then that's what you're going to get as part of your wagering menu and you you gotta you gotta adjust to that what we did have was particularly on the weekends outstanding 11 race 10 11 race cards week in week out and from a graded stake standpoint and the listed stakes they were out of this world and you looked at all the we talked repeatedly through the meet about the new york bread allowance races on the turf, they were particularly lucrative. They were the ones that were producing 10 to 1, 12 to 1, 15 to 1 winners. And it, it made for some outstanding $2,000 trifectas. I mean, this is where you really made your money during this meet. And to, to shift gears away from that portion of the discussion and into some specifics, everybody's talking about the Johnny V's and, and Todd Pletcher, Linda Rice. We talked a little bit at the beginning of the, of the show. There are some horses, I thought, and some owners and things that really needed to be singled out. Tom Bush and Get Stormy. I, I, this is, if there's one horse that would define this meet, it, it was Get Stormy, winning the Baruch and the Four Star Dave. With tremendous guts, Tom Bush, a guy that isn't going to get mentioned nationally, has done an unbelievable job. And, and I didn't want the, the beat to end and our opportunity to end without bringing that uh, terrific effort, both efforts up, uh, Javier Castellano riding both the uh, wins. Uh, telling, with uh, winning the Sword Dancer again, hadn't won a race between last year's Sword Dancer and this, and here's Steve Hobby, shows up, wins it again. He's becoming a four-star Dave. If he comes back and wins it again next year, he becomes a, a Saratoga institution. And he didn't have a win between the No, exactly, <laughs> between exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we talked about Tommy Proctor, Seth Benzel, Chad Brown, etc. cetera. Uh, Blame's win in the Whitney. Uh, it continues to be a, a, a race that you're going to go back to, and it's one of those races, Seth, where, you know, years from now, 
you, you go back and you talk about, you know, I was there, you know, Blaine beat Quality Road, you know, caught him at the 16th pole and battled him to the wire. You know, the, the, the Travers again this year, a third year in, in four where the Travers became a, a nip and tuck, uh, bobbin at the wire finish. There's been just outstanding racing, outstanding individual performances, and, and outstanding horse efforts the entire meet. And everybody John, John come Shepard, away. who has uh, Forever Together, looking for a little confidence builder, I think, uh, in this afternoon's race. But in the steeplechase races, I love the steeplechase races. I know some people don't like them, yep. but I think, I think they're fun to watch. I, I don't think they're as much of a handicapping puzzle as, as people make them out to be a lot of the time. But John Shepard won the first four, and... Uh, the fifth uh, and last uh, steeplechase of the ra uh, race of the meet couldn't get that done, but certainly to win four out of five of the steeplechase races uh, is a little feather in his cap as well. Nah, he's he does a tremendous job. It's been it's been a tremendous meet, and let's try Seth here, maybe a play or two today. You got uh, you got an idea or two to to give anybody? Uh, you you uh, go first, and I'll open my my form up. Well, if that's the case, <laughs> let's uh, let's turn maybe to the second race. Here is. Uh, uh, an allowance, uh, straightforward allowance, not an optional claimer. Non-winners are one other than a mile on the inner turf. As Seth mentioned, it, it has just been uh, the race to the swift on the grass course. There's only a certain number of, of spots you can go back and, and look. You're looking for horses that are going to be on or near the pace. In that second race, I'm real interested in quick to charm. Here's Johnny V, 8 to 1. Uh, this is first off the claim. I just think at 8 to 1, this is a horse that could sit a, a real nice trip from down inside under Velasquez and uh, is very much worth a, a play. I like uh, in that uh, turf sprint. Yield bogey, Pat Kelly uh, stays in town. He did consider the turf monster at Philly Park today. Uh, instead, yield bogey and John Luke Samin will try to uh, get it done from the two hole, six to one morning line. And I don't see where uh, Alakino Cat or Affirmative, who are the two favorites, I don't see where they're all that much better than the alternatives like yield bogey and um, even Ravallo at eight to one. So I'm looking for the two yield bogey in the stake and if I can give you another price horse here's another allowance on the grass on the inner turf I'm gonna use the seven today and try to get picture hat uh, into that fifth race uh, win picture Julian Leperu Tom Albertrani who's had a dreadful meet and uh, this one goes second time out uh, looking for another one I, I thought at uh, six to one picture hat was a horse you wanted to be involved with and I will mention Mr. Tribute in the nightcap Four to one for West Point, and Terry Finley is buying beers till seven o'clock at Ciro's if Mr. Tribute wins today, the 11th and final race of the meet. But I would also keep an eye on the four. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna at eight to one. I'm going to be looking forward to the seventh race. It's a, a made special event. I just want to see what uh, centering does. I have that one on top. AP Indy on top, composure underneath. So I think the breeding is very interesting there. Uh, also the five from uh, uh, Seth Benzel who we talked about before. It's a Malibu Moon. I love Malibu Moon firsters. So you got some prices there that could be interesting. Also going to throw in the ten and the one in that race because I think there's enough prices to go four deep. It may pay off. So that's an interesting race as I well. I like it. And we are now going to wrap things up. We're we're the last show on the network here. We're we're gonna we're gonna turn the lights out and head out for uh, wrap up. Uh, we're gonna wreck the giants. <laughs> so good. Bust it up. We're buying the beers now. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, just before we go, always do like to thank all the folks here uh, who make this possible. Uh, the folks on the camera this year: Dan Hayes, Pat Peretta, Pete Perse uh, Persico, uh, Kurt. Kirk Flick, uh, the folks down in the uh, studio down in Schenectady. Uh, certainly uh, want to thank uh, Capitol TV President John Signor uh, because it's always great. You know, uh, the rest of the year, even the, during the, the meet, uh, most of the time I'm sitting home and I'm a viewer like you, and boy, it's great to have a couple of hours of live racing program coming from uh, the, the backstretch every day during the meet. So uh, we appreciate Capitol OTV's support for that kind of programming. Don't forget, if you enjoy this programming, uh, viewer mail at capitalotv.com. Uh, that's always important to let the, the folks down there know what you like and what you'd like to see next year and what you'd like to see during the year even. So viewer mail at capitalotv.com. Finally, have to thank uh, the, the man in the, the trailer, Jim Barber, the guy who uh, 
comes up here uh, in July, sets everything up, and he's been here uh, all month long for the shows in the morning, for the whiz on the weekends, and uh, later today he gets to wrap up the sleeping bag and head home. <laughs> head home for September. And uh, uh, so I, I guess that's pretty much I oh, also want to thank, of course, our sponsors, Whitehall Racing, uh, Whitehall Stable and Carol Quorum Racing, who uh, sponsored us here on Keyword Saratoga for the meet. So, Steve, we're wrapping things up. And any final words? I just I would love to get uh, some people who may not have uh, ever had a chance to tune into the show I do on Sirius XM at the races. It's Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, Sirius 126, XM 243. And it's three hours of daily uh, national perspective talk. Seth joins me uh, on Wednesdays and uh, pretty much cover everything in the world of thoroughbred racing. And uh, you can also visit uh, online uh, as well. We stream on the net. Uh, use my name, stevebick.com, B-Y-K is the last name. Yeah, if you Google Steve Bick, that's the first one that comes up. I'm like and a you, rash on the you, internet. You can pull the, up. Uh, uh, and of course, derbytrail.com. We're going to uh, get some people, I think, uh, have got a lot of interest. Uh, come to derbytrail.com or dtstables.com for those of you who've asked me about uh, getting involved with our, our racehorses. And that nothing we're like doing. a little uh, a win up here to make, make for some nice advertising. Oh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you mean, a win at Sarasota? See, I think I've got Oh, wait, you don't have a win picture? You've I been do have a win picture, picture out for like the last two weeks. I, absolutely. No, it's here. It's here. It's somewhere. <laughs> there it is. Look at this. This is unbelievable. Right. <laughs> well, well, come on. The, the, oh, he's got it. This was un. The, look at huh? How great was this? It's unbelievable. Yeah, I, I, I knew you I, had to have it. You've had it on I, your I arm just, for, for uh, what the last? It's been a, what, a week and uh, week and a day. I'm having it tattooed on my chest. Actually, uh, uh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are going to wrap. We are going to wrap things up now for uh, all the programming here, which was great. News desk and uh, track facts and uh, down the stretch, uh, the Saratoga special. As I say, most of the time I'm sitting home watching. It's just been great programming throughout the meet. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Again, viewer mail at capitalotv.com if you want to give a thumbs up. I'm going to wrap it up. We're going to turn out the lights and head out. We'll be back up here hopefully. Uh, 46 weeks from now, the regular programming. 45 weeks. TV, 45. 45. Yeah. It's no longer a six-week meet. Yeah, Seven weeks. The regular programming starts, of course, right back on Capital OTV TV on uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings, as usual, from the studio down in Schenectady. Again, turn out the lights. We'll see you next time. Keyword Saratoga is out of here. For comments or suggestions, please write to the general manager at the OTB Television Network, 510 Smith Street, Schenectady, New York, 12305.